Hello, this is Deacon, and this is Deacon Pat, and I'm Deer. So Deacon and Deer welcomes you today to the show. It's all about marriage, right, honey? Yes. So what do you think about marriage? To me, it's a mathematical problem that Einstein couldn't even solve. <laughs> it's like one and one equals one. What do yes. you think? <laughs> Theologically speaking, though, it all started, marriage all started. In the Bible with Adam and Eve. In Genesis. Yes, it, and God, the, the family of God, because remember, in the beginning there was still the Trinity. Because in the creation stories, it talks about we creating the world and people. And it's the Trinity is the first family. And we are meant to imitate and be an example on earth of that family. That's why the Bible talks about the man and the woman being one. And we can become one because of Christ. So we really, in a sense, a marriage is a trinity of Jesus, the wife, and the husband, you know, and I think, man and woman. You know, I think, I think um, that the two most important things about the trinity is they, had, well, maybe three, is they had unity, and they had love, and then they had peace. Exactly. They have unity, love, and peace. The three go together. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, that's <laughs> the, the whole idea is that the Trinity was so full of love that they wanted to share the love and create human beings to share their love with. And so that the love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is manifested in creation. And if you'll remember, the Bible story is that Adam was created first, and then we find out that, well, you know, Adam he was naming animals, but he didn't have a partner. He was alone, and he didn't have a suitable mate. And so then God created a mate for him. And I always like to call that a whoopee moment, moment for men, <laughs> because it's like now he has a woman to share his life with. And, and a part of that is also to share his sexuality with. I think it's great that um, that God doesn't do anything but perfection. So when God created Adam, and then he thought, he said, man should not be alone. I shall create a helpmate. And he said, woman, that for the two, man and wife, the mother and the wife shall be one, and they shall leave their father and mother and cling to the wife, and the two shall become one. And I create, we pray that every single morning. We say, um, what do we say? When first in the morning, we say, come Holy Spirit. Right. Let me say, um, the man and shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one. We what started, God is joined together. Let, let no, no man, man put asunder. We start each day with prayer because we feel like we need the grace, and the grace of the marriage comes from the two becoming one, and from two, the sacrament of marriage. It's our vocation. Pat has two vocations, actually, though. He's a deacon, Anna, and he's also a um, husband. But we, I was going to talk today. We were talking about, yet last week on the air, we were talking about falling in love. That's the easy part. Today we're going to talk about living in love. And so Adam and Eve, they lived in love for a long time. And then? Then they decided uh, that they wanted to be God-like apart from God. And that's, you know, when we talk about choice, that's very much what choice is all about, is do we want to be with God or not? And that's the major choice that we all have. And Adam and Eve decided, well, they could do it on their own, that they really didn't need God, that they wanted to be God-like. And God does want us to be God-like, but in union with him, not apart from him. And so they ate from the apple of the knowledge of good and evil. Well. That's basically deciding you're God and you can decide what's good and evil. And only God can decide that because only God knows the full ramifications of the choices we make. Yeah, I think um, I think it's very important to know that life is choice, right? And that love is choice and then marriage is choice. In this world where everyone wants to do whatever they want, it's like it's a, it's a comical joke in our family. Do whatever you want. But really, if you don't mean that, you whatever you want, except for 
in Christ, you know, without sin, or be whoever you want, be yourself, but in Christ without sin. The more we get rid ourselves from sin and death and adapt a life of virtue instead of vice, we become more like Christ. He fills us with his love and his grace. Today, do you feel empty? Do you feel like maybe you're not, you're walking in a, in a sin that you don't really want to get rid of? What does Paul say about the sin? I do the things. We all, because <laughs> of our sinful nature, we do the things we don't want to do. And we need God to help us uh, not do those things. And Adam and Eve, you know, and they were in love. They were very open with each other. And they were naked. They walked in naked the garden. Naked and ashamed. Right. And the nakedness that implies that they weren't worried about being vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, because they trusted each other. They trusted God. And when they sinned against God, that bond is broken. Mm -hmm. That's the, And breaking our bond with God breaks the bond with each other because God is the glue. This Holy Spirit is the glue that helps us to be one uh, and be in unity. And so the consequences are horrible in terms of Adam and Eve. Uh, they're ashamed. They don't trust each other. And we quickly see that the story gets worse, that death comes about. And so we see because of sin, first they're suffering because they're no longer in the garden and uh, no longer with God. And this is not God punishing them. This is themselves choosing, again, the choice they made to be apart from God and not accept his will. They say the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. Who doesn't like a gift? I'm all about a gift. So this is what we're trying to say today is in marriage. There are Adam and Eve were happy together, you know, happy together. And then they fell into sin. Well, you know, when you're in sin, things start not going right in your relationships, in your life. A light goes off in your head. I always like to say um, that there be light and there was light. And that God said, ready the light from the darkness. Well, it's that same every single day in your life. You have a choice. Do I walk in the light of Christ or walk in the darkness? And when the light goes off, you know that you need to run to confession. That's my that's my big thing is confession. A lot of people don't like confession, but in a marriage, you really, you almost can, your wife, and if you lose your wife as your like person that tells you, boy, it sounds like we're in sin or you're in sin and vice versa with the husband. It's not an act of anger or meanness. It's an act of love to say, by the way, we need to go to confession. It's a, I heard um, Daniel Bean, a Catholic mom, say that her husband do that as a date. I think that's a great date. We do it as a, we, have, we go to uh, Orlando to go to confession because it's got the queen of the universe and it's a beautiful place and we love to go just for like a date to go there and then do that. I encourage y'all, if, if there's darkness in your marriage and you don't go, what's going on? I just don't, things don't feel right. Take your husband's hand and invite him to run to confession. You know what I want to talk about though, besides this, honey? When you live in love for a long time, you know, falling in love and living in love, all of a sudden you light goes off and you begin to see that things that, that you loved about your husband or your wife begin to drive you a little crazy. You begin to be like, Whoa, I didn't know they did that. And we instead of looking at the husband with eyes of love, you look at him like in a microscope. You go like, Whoa, he has some defects. <laughs> it's my like Caitlin, our six child always told me about if you look at people through a microscope, you're gonna see all their defects. So you try to be not blind to the defects, but unless it's sin, as a wife, I give in. Because unless it's sin, I'm not going to be picking at the fact that maybe he left his towel on the floor. I'll just pick it up. <laughs> I'll just pick it up. It doesn't bother me. But I had eight children, so it really doesn't bother me. But if it's going to be sin against you, then you have to say, by the way, like not like this, da, 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 but encourage them to walk away from sin and close to Christ. I want them to do the same for me. I don't know if I want the picky stuff, but... If, you, if you're if used to it, you're like, okay, what do you think, honey? Yeah, I, I think... This was your projector, I, provider, well, high priest. <laughs> one thing we know is that because of the fall, mm -hmm. and, and why we're telling this story, is for people to understand how difficult it is for men and women, and why there have been constant struggles. It's because of the fall, because God intended men and women, each of them, to be in the image and likeness of God. Not just men but men and women. And actually the more perfect image of God is men and women together because God has feminine characteristics. And it's not that we're anti-women or female that we call God the Father. We call God the Father because that's 
what he said he is. That's what our relationship should be with him. But he made men and women in his image. And we have the opportunity to be mutual and share our qualities and talents and differences for the good, or we can fight about it. And men and women have been fighting since Adam and Eve in so many ways. And that's why we needed Jesus to come to restore the true love in marriage. You know, I was thinking, we have we have seven children, a living children, one baby in heaven. We feel like he prays for us. He's like our intercessor. He's up there. He was two hours old. He died full term. He's like our treasure. But we talked to one couple. I don't know if I should say the name. I don't know on the name. We talked to one couple, and because of the fact that in our family, a lot of people come in the family, and they have, you know, a lot of things that the parents may more than one parent, may one parent raise them, may one parent birth them. It's just a lot of stuff that they have in their life due to the fact that we're in a fallen world and we love them all. We like we like all. But um, we kind of encourage one couple to go, you know, one thing we like to do is say to each other, you know, divorce is never an option. I give you my whole heart. We may go ups and downs in marriage, mountains and valleys, but we give you our whole heart and divorce is not an option. We'll work it out no matter what. And the, the husband and wife looked at us and said, oh, we did that before we even got married. And then we went to our other child recently, this other child getting married. And we go, you know, this one couple, the, you know, we want to go like this one daughter that we know. They did, did this sort of thing. And I talked to the new daughter-in-law to me and she said, oh, we already talked about that as well. I said, wow, we were behind. <laughs> we didn't talk about our wedding day or before. We talked about it. We realized that life gets messy. And then even though you have the best motives and your heart is big and love, things happen. And and maybe get really busy. So in marriage, the falling in love is easy. And then the living in love is a daily choice. You have to choose above your flesh. You just say, is that really worth fighting over? Is that really worth bothering me? You have to suffer a lot of things under Christ and go like, by the way, I'm not gonna say anything. I'm just gonna let the Lord, I'm, I'm not gonna suck it up. Suck it up isn't my favorite word, you know that. I'm not gonna suck it up. I'm gonna suffer this under Christ. Is this a big deal? Wouldn't Jesus do this for his his spouse, the bride, the, the, the church, the church, wouldn't he say, hmm, does God come down to hammer? You just looked at me wrong. <laughs> you just, you just, you just left your underwear on the floor. <laughs> He's not going to do that, is he? So suffer under Christ means that a lot of times in marriage, it's not you do the, that you let nothing bother you, but the bigger things, unless it's sin, I do, I do try. Now my parents going to say, no, I don't, but I try unless there was a repeated but you know, I want to talk about the, the husband being the protector, provider, and high priest to guard against the, to keep the love alive. It takes, you know, we'll talk about Gary Smalley at the end, his languages of love, but it also takes the husband being the, more the head of the home. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it's important as, as we talk and why it's difficult is to, uh, what Ellen and I like to say is, we are imperfect people loving imperfectly. That's right. That's right. And each day, as she said, make choices. And sometimes we make the wrong choices. But we know that we are supposed to be together and that we'll be together in eternity if we look out for each other. Because one of the beauties of the marriage in the church is that we are meant to to bring each other to heaven. That's right. That's one Rub of our key tasks. Right, and right if our is. spouse doesn't make their, their, God's gonna ask us about that on judgment day. Mm -hmm. That's true. And, and you know, um, and the little things with great love is St. Teresa the Little Flower, Mother Teresa, and um, Helen Keller, I like to mention her, throw her in, and, and Teresa of Avila, they all have the same mentality. If I do little things each day with great love, I will be blessing my spouse. But this is what Pat and I found out. We're opposites, and opposites attract. But then if they don't really talk things out, they can drive each other crazy. So Pat and I figured, do unto others as you want others to do unto you. Doesn't work for us in the All the man. time. No, the so, sometimes it works great, but sometimes uh, it does not really work that great. I do for Pat what I would think was a great thing. Like for, I say a year, that's 365 days, y'all. And I send him little cards in, in the mail every week for well 52 weeks and he'd open the car and i somebody didn't tell me he got it and i thought man i am blessing my husband language of love encouraging words in the car <laughs> and Patty came home one day and it was like after a really long time of doing this he said by the way 
I, if you want to do that for yourself, that's great. <laughs> this cost this stamp money. Go, oh, whoa. <laughs> I had like seven little children. I was like taking the time each day. I still this day write cards and letters on Monday to bless someone. <laughs> So you're very if, you don't, if you don't want to cover a letter, please tell me it's costing me <clears throat> stamps. It's costing money. I'm thinking I'm blessing someone. You have to be honest with one another in marriage, right? Mm -hmm. So Pat, Pat actually would never buy me a toaster, my honey. Oh, that's <laughs> not a real gift. <laughs> he would never say, I washed your clothes for you. Now, you know, wasn't that a blessing? I go like, I could do it myself. We would never make a plate for each other. You know, I made you your food plate. I watched my daughter, one of them, make a plate for her little six children and her husband. It would not bless us. I, I'm a picky eater and pats us. I didn't do it myself. <laughs> so these are things you, in marriage, that's not a negative. That's like you're going towards Christ together by saying to the person in love, thank you, kindly. <laughs> I can do it myself. Otherwise, you think, say, there was a pizza incident, remember, honey? where we had pizza every Friday night with the kids. Now, granted, it was Little Caesars. That's all we could afford. And we had it every Friday night. And then Pat and I were, became empty nesters. So I'm thinking he liked the pizza Friday. He thinks I like it. So forever we were making the pizza. Not buying it. I'm not making it. Buying the pizza. Have it delivered. And neither one of us was liking the pizza every Friday night. I was counting the calories. And he was, he was saying, I really don't even like pizza at all. <laughs> right? So these are things in marriage that living in love, there's bumps in the road. Pat will always say, um, um, I like to be adventurous, but my wife is a speed bump, right? You say that. <laughs> I say, but you say about me too on the adventure, the adventure stuff, like yeah. jumping out of an airplane. But on some things I say that as well, because you know, you have to look at your candidate. My candidate's Pat, and I, I have to go like, hmm, that'd be a lot of fun. But would Pat like that? And where you get in discontentment and in living and love going crash and burn, is to think, well, I wish my husband go to the gym with me. Now, Pat likes to exercise at home. He either likes to walk or do something physical like that would work for burning calories. I like to go to the gym. I used to go alone all the time. I had to accept, well, these are not what he does. We have to accept the way they are, right? Love him the way he is. What's that one that joke he made today that I always said it engage with again? Um, the wife. Yeah, the wife, <laughs> as she's marching towards the altar, the him she says, things to herself I'll alter him <laughs> so yes I'll be like going to marriage if you're newlyweds or have you just engaged or if you're an old married couple you don't want to ever look at what can I change about him I love the expression it goes like this it was from Rachel Balducci keep your eyes on your own paper my un my nuns used to say it differently they would say like this Patrick you have enough to worry about with Patrick and Ellen you have enough to worry about with Ellen look in your own heart each day what can I do to be closer to Jesus? How can I get rid of sin and let more of God in? What can I do to love Pat more in the way he likes to be loved? So what are the things you want to say on Gary Smalley's um, language of love? Yeah, there's, one a, of them. there's a lot of materials out there that are helpful in terms of helping to understand your mate. Um, but any of those things, when you start talking about categorizing people, you have to be careful with that because nobody's going to fit exactly into any category but there are common themes that can be helpful in terms of understanding uh, your wife and uh, you know you might find value in reading about the languages of love and languages of apology and so th there are various books uh, that you can uh, read that can be helpful you have to be selective about that and you know one of the things about imperfect people loving imperfectly <laughs> Ellen <laughs> likes to uh, tell uh, engaged couples because we taught uh, uh, couples for 20 uh, years yeah 20 <laughs> years and, and uh, would talk about uh, marriage and difficulties and one of the things she likes to talk about which I think is a really great analogy is to talk about roses oh, tell I like them about that. roses I like, that. I like that there's a there's a popular show that I personally do not watch however people tell you about it is on TV and it's also a, uh, I guess the younger generation favorite it doesn't portray true love to me, the show. But one of the taglines is, we accept this rose. I didn't even know what you were going to say, honey. We never know what each other's going to say in the show. It's just like live. It's just like live. But um, I decided, I heard the Lord speak to me and say in my heart, why don't you bring some roses for each of the people? So I brought a number of roses to the Engage Weekend, put in the back of the room on Friday night, the first night of the thing, and tried to keep it concealed to the end. And so at the end, I said, you know, gentlemen, 
go back through and pick a rose for your for your wife that should be and just you know that's all like instruction i gave and one guy that i knew came up to me and he said you know what i look for the rose with the least amount of thorns i go wow that's great except for <laughs> it's the thorns in your life that cement the marriage he was like I wrote up in Catholic Mom. It's called We Accept This Rose. I write for a Catholic Mom a lot about marriage and family. But think about this. Those who are listening today, do a little rewind in your mind and think about your life together. We had a baby die and we had parents die. We also had three weddings in a year. Each one was a little bit of a sacrifice and some were a lot. But the thorns in our life were the thing that cemented us together. We've been empty nesters for a while. I mean, that's been a thorn because I miss the children. We've been, we've, I, I suffer in my body from car accidents I've had. That's a thorn in life. It cements us together. Some thorns don't do that. Some they draw you apart and that you get bitter instead of better. Right. right. Yep. And you have to just guard that. That's when you need, in our church we have marriage encounter. We have rep to run. We have um, priests to talk to, deacons to talk to. Mentoring couples is one of our favorite. Not that we've, Pat mentors some young men, but it's mentoring couples is a real positive way because I'm a mommy mentor to women. But as a couple to mentor, these are the things you have to have in place as you grow in marriage and realize, whoa, I can't do this alone. See, nobody can. <laughs> That's the truth. So, what do you want to say about yeah, that? I, yeah, I think in finding couples who will support you in your marriage. Uh, that's important. It's just like picking friends. Do you, you know, for your kids? Do you pick friends that are helping them grow? Are you picking uh, couples that are helping you to grow closer to Jesus, or are they pulling you further away? And we all need support and help uh, in, on our journey towards heaven. And if I could speak to all the priests out there, having a mentoring couple in your church is a positive, and it really does build. You have to make choose wisely and know the couple well and match the right couple the right couple. Having a mentoring mommy in the in the office that ties two women is very important. And having a, a priest or deacon on board that's in the office, very important. People don't want to make an appointment. You have to be like the Maytag repairman. In one church, I just sat there on Tuesday and Thursday, see if someone come. When they came, it was very important. But other ways we keep our marriage alive. So before, because our time is getting short, but we can talk all day. And then you would hunt you too, so you delete us. So some things we do is Pat and I have established a date night. We, when we kids were little, we were in a Christian community called Hallelujah. Most of our date night was meetings. There were so many meetings in the early days that, that we couldn't fit in a date night. Now that was probably not the best. So we put a date night in. And because, like we said, we're opposites, <laughs> we know that one week Pat picks the date night and one week I do. And that has worked well for us. Now Pat's telling me to pick all of them. But... <laughs> I still say you should pick some. And the other thing we put into place, and Pat will remember other things that I haven't thought of, but we go away together. We go often now away because Pat's in the ministry and that takes the weekends and that's a lot of time. But we go away together at least once a year when the kids are little without the children. Maybe the nursing baby came along. Right. It used to be Catholic medical. That was our main one. We go away. It'd be like a highlight. I'd look forward to it for one. And I, I'd forget. I would have the amnesia to forget. I'm a mother. <laughs> I come back and I go, whoa, I have all, all these right. kids. I really had a relaxation time. It was very important. Yeah, what and else and, you, and we, we were fortunate that we had parents who were willing That's to right. help us out and look after the kids when we went away. And so grandparents, that, that is an important role I think you can play in terms of helping your children, uh, giving them time with just each other without a child. Is, is a good idea at least once a year if not a, several times during the year and you know what I'm, that we're talking on that because a few more minutes is what other roles do grandparents play they could be the mentoring couple but that's not ideal they should be the wise old owl they should be the intercessor they should be the one praying and watching from afar i call my girls every day now i haven't been doing as much lately because i'm trying to get some books to the finish line i'm publishing some books but I call them every day. Now they think I'm lonely. Well, I'm new here, but I'm not that lonely. I have plenty of friends back home in Augusta. So I call them and I try to read between the lines. What do they need prayer for? And then when I hang up or I tell Pat, we need to pray for this child because of blah, blah, blah. This is the role of a mother for sure. Now Pat, he's a doctor and a deacon. So what do they call you for? <laughs> Medical <laughs> problems and, and sometimes spiritual issues too. If you have a listening ear and you're available, 
we had we had one grandson come and just ask pat some advice randomly at the pool we had the family beach trip and that's another thing we do we have a family beach trip once a year now that the kids are older we bring all the grandkids and the cousins together this builds a marriage and it builds a family one random child talked to pat and i was so blessed by that see if you, they know where the wisdom lies and they will come to you but i'm not a real fan of and i'm going to say it clearly pat can really in, reiterate it i'm not a fan of giving free advice unless it's asked for you know we had dr ray on the show i do a show called wow mom with jane ann bombrook and he said no that's a no-no it could isolate you from the children it could isolate you from the grandchildren but be there to say or you could say you know what i would do but hey I would say, don't listen to me because you probably know better than I do. Because, you know, they want to do it their way. As a marriage, you should, Pat and I did this. We looked at what his parents did. We looked at what my parents did. We took some of the good from his parents and some of the good from mine. And we didn't do the bad of either one. We made our own mistakes. We were really good at that. We didn't ask, like, we didn't have to ask. So it's really a bushel important. Full. And, the, and, the, and the, lastly, the uh, last to build the marriage is not to go. You look just like your father. He was so handsome. That's why I married, married you. <laughs> I said, no, not to go like you act just like your father, which I could be guilty of that a time or two. Or you're doing that like your mother did. We are what makes up the marriage is the, the couple. And I see we're Ita I'm Italian family. Italian, Italian, all Italian. Pat's Irish and German. And so there, you could really do some cut lows if you really try on that makes up our differences, right? So to try really hard, and I apologize, honey, if I've ever done that, honey, I ask you for forgiveness. I do ask you, if I ever said, like, you look like your father. I right? forgive you. No, I'm saying that that's the other key to living in love. We read a book called, you're going to have to remember the, the author, um, Unoffendable. We read it because all the community, I'm still an associate member there, and they were reading the book, and I thought, well, someone gave it to me. I think it was Judy, my pro painter, and I just loved the book, and Pat loved the book. We read it twice. We want to do a study in church on it because it took a subject that's very tender, offended, <laughs> anger, getting upset about little things, and made it kind of a not humorous, not that it's funny to hurt yeah. someone's heart, but that we, we took that. But part. people are so easily offended these days, it seems, and people talk about microaggression and all that. Well, you know, we shouldn't be so offendable because we should be thankful for what Jesus did for us. And therefore, if we're thankful, then we're not going around looking for every little thing that, that somebody does that wrong or upsets us or uh, offends us. And as scripture says, you know, forgive seven times 77, you know, in terms of just forgiving and, and letting it go. And so uh, it's, it's a good book to uh, read. So we're going to conclude here quickly, I think. And we start out with talking about our first show is of falling in love. Listen, that show is, is a little bit lighter. And this show is living in love and some points and tidbits to do. And then next time we'll talk about loving through Christ. That when you begin to, you know, we said physical is the easy part. And then <coughs> emotionally would more be the living in love part. And we're going to talk about, about um, living for Christ spiritually joined together. It's very important. Pat and I go to daily mass. We can together in adoration when we can. Then we'll talk about that more next time. But um, the main thing we want to say here is that um, when you marry and you choose the sacrament of marriage and the Catholic faith, you stand before God and you're accountable to God and you give your hearts to him. And to always know that you're going to make mistakes. And it's not just like this. Sorry, please forgive me. I offended you. Well, of course. Yeah, I'm, I know you're sorry. But when it gets to hurt your heart, that's when sometimes you need extra help. You might need help from, from just walking together in a new way, grace from the sacrament through Mass and confession. You may need help from, a, from an outside um, counselor or priest. Be careful who you choose. Mentoring couples. There's many ways to do that, living in love, without just going, mm, suck it up. Right? Right. And all that we're saying and we want to be clear that we're trying to be consistent with the teachings of the Catholic Church. That's right. That's right. Clear that what we're we're proposing is consistent with mm -hmm. our sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium. And if we're off, it's just a mistake because we want to be faithful to the church and by being faithful to the body of Christ, we're being faithful to Christ himself. Because without him, um, 
a marriage is almost impossible. That's right. I um I did a show. I hate to keep mentioning this show. It was called Season Marriage. That I like got married a long time. I'm John Murphy, and he was he was giving him 15 minutes on the show. We gave him the whole show because every word he said was a tidbit, a, a pearl of great price. The main thing he said, honey, and I know you heard this, was look at that person that you married. That's your treasure. That's your treasure. That's why I wear the pearl. And next time I'll tell why I did the pearl over a diamond once I gave my piece, my treasure. And the thing is, I hope I'm his. Pearl of great price. <laughs> okay, but, so thank you for listening today. We, um, we do want to be faithful to the church. And we want to do some practicals too. Because you know what? You can read the entire Bible in one night. <laughs> if you're up for like 24 hours. And just like engulf it. But better yet, take small baby steps. You may be doing something right. Now you're doing some things wrong. Don't get overwhelmed. Everyone makes mistakes. If, if you try to live in that mistake, there could be a problem. The fruit could be bad. So listen to what we're saying. May listen twice. Take a tidbit. It'll plant a seed in your heart and let it grow. And don't get frustrated. There's plenty of avenues, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's extra people to talk to. So thank you for listening. This is Deacon and Deer. So we say, we're traveling along, along singing, singing a song, song side by side. side. God bless.